Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, November 15th, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions, and that's pretty much the show or has been the show lately. But there's a few things in addition to that. Obviously, your questions on trading. If you don't mind, keep your questions relative to what's on the slides. And as we get to the end of the slides and when I open it up for individual stock picks, number one, feel free to ask questions in general. And number two, let me know what your favorite stock picks are. We'll take a look at them. If you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. You can ask about as many as you want, but that's for your benefit. Just hit return after you punch in the symbol. I know quite a few symbols, but not all of them, so you might have to give me the symbol. So this week I want to talk about what happens in a bear market and signs and signals, and then I'm going to do a little bit of a redux on simple tweaks that might be all that stands between you and your success, and that's applying a little discretion. Before we do all that, there's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often summing up. All predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Thanks to my buddy, Greg Morris, for that. As I've been saying quite a bit, I would recommend you take the free market timing course, which you can find on my website. If you don't see the banner ad on the home page, which sometimes does change, which would be down here. We could just put your stuff in and then wait for an email shortly thereafter. Just go to the members area and sign up. And there's also an introductory course there, which I draw heavily from in a lot of these presentations, even though a lot of the stuff is very basic. There's a lot of good stuff in there. And it, it even reminds me even to think about keeping things simple and how markets really work and how markets are emotionally driven. Now, a theme for quite a while has been winter is coming, and then for a while we've said winter is still coming, and now it looks like winter is here. So let's talk about what you need to know in a bear market. I was working on editing my IPO course for the learning management system yesterday, and I came across some slides on how rats leave a ship, kind of an allegory or analogy or metaphor for what happens to stocks. And I thought it'd be interested, interesting to update that and share it with you. Now, as you know, the old Wall Street adage, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's fine and dandy as long as we're in a nice longer term bull market like we've been in for a long, 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 long time. And that's fantastic. And pretty much all stocks go up. Everybody feels like a genius. You no longer need Big Dave because you just randomly buy stocks or just buy the Dorn Index for that matter. Unfortunately, eventually that comes to an end. And just like a rising tide lifts all boats, a sinking ship sinks all stocks. And you have to be very careful of, for instance, I got an email from a mutual fund company that said, hey, hey, don't worry about this. This is just sector rotation. Well, that's a very dangerous game to play, again, because a sinking tide will sink all ships. Now, this is a graphic I updated, and it's sort of like the rats leaving the ship. They sort of climb up to the highest part. And then eventually the ship sinks. So the first thing that usually happens is the small cap stocks get hit hard. And I've also included momentum stocks in there too. One thing you will find in trading, and this is from a psychological standpoint and then from a methodology standpoint and getting a feel for the market is a lot of times what's going on with you is a microcosm for what's going on with other people in the market. So you'll find that your portfolio, if you're trading these momentum stocks, will get whacked pretty hard, even though the market might be making these marginal new highs. I have found 
through keeping momentum less, through my own portfolio, through the model portfolio, I've witnessed this many, many, many times. And for a while, I used to keep, it's probably three or four years, I used to keep what I call the Landry 100. And the only rule for that momentum list, it wasn't something I directly traded, although I did have a fund that was interested in my research and wanted me to maintain the, the portfolio for them at one point in time. But it never did get actually traded. Uh, it was a lot of work, so eventually I scrapped it. But it was not an exercise in futility. I learned a lot in the process. And again, the only rule for a stock to go in the list was that it had to be making a new high. It didn't have to be a setup. It didn't have to trigger. It just had to be making a new high. And ideally, it was a more volatile stock, a big Dave type of momentum stock. And ideally, that, that new high was on an expansion of range. Now, I wouldn't tell you to rush out or suggest you rush out and buy a bunch of stocks just as they're making new highs, although you certainly would do a lot better than trying to buy stocks as they're making new lows. The point with the portfolio was there was 100 stocks in the portfolio. And yes, yeah, some of them would make a new high and then begin to die. But the overwhelming number of them kept making new highs and certainly enough of them became such big trends or, or or kept in their trends or stayed in their trends, I should say, that made it really worthwhile as an exercise. And this thing printed money for quite a while. Now, it was not without its problems, as I have learned before and learned very much through this exercise, is that when momentum gets hit, it gets hit hard and it gets hit fast. And it gets ugly really fast. And as I've said before, Mike Moody was speaking to us once at the, I forget what city we were in, but it was American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting. And he was talking about relative strength and explaining his relative strength work and all. And, and I said, okay, Mike, well, I get it. I, and I'm a big fan of relative strength. But the one thing I can't solve for, and I literally said it like this, I said, is the fact that it ends badly. And if I could solve for that, you'd never see my fat ass again. And he's kind of soft-spoken, and he's kind of chuckled a little bit. And he said, Dave, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have a lot of baby poop. It just comes with the territory. So if you're going to trade momentum, you just have to realize that eventually it's going to end badly. Now, I don't want to digress too far. But recently, I bumped into somebody who's a reversion to the bead trader, and I don't want to throw anybody to the bus, but it's like it's another one of those things that'll work until it don't. The good news with the momentum is if you're practicing proper money management, you're going to catch a few big winners along the way and make it all worthwhile. And in a few minutes, I'm going to talk about staying with outliers with a little bit of discretion. The problem with the reversion to the mean type of trading, and I didn't mean to go off on this tangent, but since I'm here, is that it, you'll feel pretty good, and then it'll be a pretty bad blow up when it happens. Like right now, the reversion to the mean players are being taken out and shot. <laughs> so and they get a little false hope here and there, these big retrace rallies, but it gets pretty ugly pretty fast when you're fighting the trend, especially when that new trend begins to develop. So getting back to this graphic that I have here, the momentum stocks get hit hard really fast. And we're going to take a look at the Russell 2000 in just a minute. And those small cap stocks, as a general statement, get hit really hard and really fast. Now, my original diagram just had the big cap stocks here and defensive issues way up here. And I noticed in the talk that I was giving on the in the IPO webinar, I talked a lot about the super speculative issues and IPOs. So what sometimes happens is the big cap stocks get sold off hard because they're under a lot of scrutiny. And as the market begins to tank, they all begin to fall together. And I don't want to say the F word, fundamentals, but those fundamentals are scrutinized and you can hold the bigger cap issue to a fundamental better than you can a smaller cap issue, especially like an IPO. An IPO trades on pure emotions, and that's why I'm such a big IPO fan. So these big cap stocks and 
one strategy I talked about was the go go nomo, where you get these big cap stocks at high levels, and we could take a look at NTAP in just a few minutes. But GDDY was another one, INTU was another one recently that we traded, and these stocks get priced for perfection. I guess you could argue that Amazon now would be one of those stocks that's being torpedoed because it was priced for perfection. Keep in mind, and we're going to talk about this in a few minutes. I'm going to rehash it one more time, kind of beat the dead horse. But people sell stocks for a variety of reasons, a variety of reasons, he tried to say, that have nothing to do with the market itself. So when that sentiment changes, and I'm not talking about some sort of sentiment you can measure. I'm talking about the general population's feelings about stocks. Everybody feels a certain way as long as they're going up, but when they start going down, people begin to get nervous. Now, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself, but just know that people sell because they get a little emotional, a little panicky. Nothing has changed. If anything, the economy is probably better than it was before this whole sell-off sold off. Well, began. But as I often say, don't confuse the issue with facts. So the big caps begin to tank, and they begin to tank pretty hard. And you have this last little gasp in here towards super speculative stocks and IPOs. And it's a bit of a lottery ticket type of thing. People begin to say, well, the market's crappy, but what if we go after these really speculative issues that wouldn't know a fundamental if it hit them in the arse? So that's the kind of thinking that happens there. Now, when I show the super speculative issues up here in the IPOs, I'm not saying all IPOs. As I said in the IPO course, the market might look like this, and then the IPOs might look like this. Okay, begin to sell off a little later. And then you might have a little hump or two in here, and it's just a selected, selective group of IPOs. In fact, there's usually a dichotomy, and this could actually be a good thing. The ones that are strong just go up, and the ones that are crap just go down. You're not going to have very many in here. I'm, on, I'm only looking at one or two today, okay? But those one or two might be the one or two that take off, and you avoided most of them. The problem with a lot of things you hear about IPOs is they're looking at an IPO index, and an IPO index might look like that. Well, even in the IPO bear market, it, it's, I'm sorry, even during the IPO bull market that we've seen for quite a while, the overall, if you added up all the IPOs, it might actually look like a bear market. But my point is that there's enough IPOs to make, make it worthwhile trading. We're avoiding all the ones that just come public and go down. And right now it's like they're coming public and many of them are just doing this. And the examples I gave going back a year or two would be like Blue Apron and Snapchat and things like that came public and just imploded. In fact, they have a notebook here. Let me see if I can find it. And I started making a list of all the IPOs, and this was long before the bear market, of these ones that just crashed after coming public. H-Y-R-E, R-U-B-Y, X-Y-F, R-M-E-D. EB, it got to a point where SVMK, it got to a point where it's like, okay, Dave, I get it. I made my point. There's no need to write down every one of these. But what amazes me is how many come public and just die. And that usually happens within the first week of trading. So if you can hold off that first week, you'll avoid those stocks. Now, there's no guarantee you'll avoid all stinkers and IPOs. I got one right now. I just put a stop in. And hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it won't get stopped out. But if it gets stopped out, I'm ready to move on. I'm okay with being flat in this market or certainly being without longs. So, again, the point is, and I know I'm kind of beating a dead horse here, the point is not that you want to rush out and trade every IPO, but keep an eye on the IPOs. There might be one or two that could defy gravity. Now, it could be in some area that is hot even though we're in a bear market now it was weed stocks for a while and looks like that's kind of cooled off a little bit but it could be something else and we don't know and there's some very selective biotech 
type of IPOs right now that seem to be doing fairly well in spite of the overall market, in spite of the representative sector. And again, there's a few little speculative issues that people will still pile into. And one way to look at that, look at this is it's a bit of a lottery ticket mentality when it comes to these super speculative issues. Now, there's an old Wall Street adage that there's always a bull market somewhere. That's simply not true. There may be times, there may be times when, yeah, commodities are doing pretty good or gold's doing okay in spite of the overall market. And that's fine going out and trade those stocks and getting along those stocks. And, and that's my job to find those and, and trade those. But as a blanket statement, that's just simply false. You're going to find that even those so-called defensive issues such as foods and consuming our durables and drugs will eventually go down with the ship. And that's where it's okay to be in cash. I'm going to talk a lot about shorting here in a few minutes and how why I think you should short. I'm just going to, I won't talk a lot about it. I'll touch upon it again. But it's okay to just sit in cash. Cash is not trash. So the point is the sinking ship eventually sinks all stocks. And those defensive issues, the argument there is like, well, in a bear market, you still need toilet paper. In a bear market, you still need drugs. Well, you might even need more drugs in toilet paper paper in a bear market. But you don't necessarily want to blindly rush over to those stocks. And again, it's like these emails about, oh, we're seeing some sector rotation. It's like, well, what are you rotating into? You're rotating into some ugly stocks from these really ugly stocks or some crappy stocks from the not as crappy stocks? Or I said that backwards, but you get the idea. So be careful of that. And it amazes me at how many people or trying to fight this thing instead of letting it unfold. Now, here I have the Russell 2000 using the IWM ETF and the S&P 500. And one thing I didn't even realize until I put the presentation together, and that's why I love teaching so much, is I learn a lot myself. But take a look at when the Russell topped out. Now, before I go any further, there is no, uh, the scaling is not to scale on this, okay? The peaks and troughs are, but there's no actual scaling. So it doesn't mean that the Russell was above the S&P or the S&P was above the Russell. The point I'm trying to make here is the Russell peaked out on August 31st and began to drop. And the Russell was the black line. So you can see the black line here, it gets a little muddy when it crosses over. But you can see that it began to roll over in here and right here. And then it began to head lower long before the S&P topped out. So the S&P topped out several weeks later in September, believe it or not. And these are closing highs or closes, I should say, of the chart. And you can see then the S&P began to sell off. So this was the point I made, I think it was in 2014 when I did the first presentation on the rats leaving the ship, is that the smaller cap stocks and these momentum related stocks will get hit first. And then the rest of the market, especially, especially, and this is something you might want to write down, but especially the momentum big cap stocks, such as the Amazons and the GoDaddies and the Intaps and stocks like that everything you've been seeing on a lander list for the past three weeks. So case in point, the small cap stocks vis-a-vis -vis the Russell 2000 topped out before the bigger cap stocks vis-a-vis -vis the S&P 500, at least in this last little sell-off. And I'd be willing to bet if you go out through history, you're going to find it's going to look a lot like that, at least over the last... 10 years for sure. Now, I just grabbed an IPO that I was looking, I've been keeping an eye on lately, and it recently broke out at a buy at the type of pattern. And now it's pulled back. But you can see it nearly doubled in value. And this whole time, during this whole period of time, 
it the market itself what did the market itself do it actually headed lower now you can go in and look at a lot of ipos and say well dave a lot of ipos went straight down well that's not my point my point is that selected ipos and selected super speculative stocks will outperform the market you just have to pick your spots really carefully and you also have to as i've written before about volatility you have to know the devil you're dealing with okay and by that it's like okay we know these things are super speculative we know these stocks are super volatile so we're going to adjust our share size down accordingly to compensate for that extra volatility ipos have a benefit as funds have to buy some to build an initial position before they get ready really evaluated on performance the first judgment is made on initial pricing it does not reset for a few weeks. Okay, well, that's something that I was not aware of, Phil. If you have some sort of um, research to back that up, I, I would like to uh, add that in to the IPO course and the IPO section of the uh, members area. The I spent a lot of time in the IPO course saying the reason IPOs can outperform, not all of them, because again, not to beat the dead horse, but there's usually a, a pretty good dichotomy and that dichotomy, again, increases during a bear market. But the reason they can outperform is there is a bit of a push to make them succeed. The people that bring them public push to make them succeed. As I often say, I'm not going to use the word manipulation. I guess I just did. There's probably a little manipulation in there to try to keep that price up. There's a lot of things that happen. There's people that are tied up that can't sell. And if you are someone who has a very large account and you are able to get shares on these IPOs, if you get designated as a flipper, they're not going to give you the next big hot IPO. So you have a little bit of an encouragement not to flip, flip them out. So, yeah, there's a lot of fun and games, a lot of things that happen to keep IPOs afloat. Absolutely. Now, just real quick, and it always amazes me how you can come back to the basics of all basics and the market makes sense when you think about it like this now easy for me to say while i'm screaming f-bombs and shouting at the screen <laughs> my wife walked by to tell me goodbye this morning and she's like who are you talking to i'm like my screens <laughs> but i was actually trying to do that little um little thing i talked about instead of f-bombs and i'll try to like lighten it up a little bit like you could do it or something like that <laughs> anyway so people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And the point I'm trying to make here is that when you do find yourself in this emotional state, just back yourself out to the fact that markets are moved on emotions and you're trading traders and not markets. And when uh, something happens where there's a big rush to the door, there's more supply than demand, then those stocks will go down and vice versa on the upside and in sharp short covering rallies people rush in to bottom pick and people rush in to cover and that that causes the market to create a vacuum higher that creates more demand than supply and then eventually with the retrace rally ends what happens is supply meets demand so getting back to the potential bear market in the works, the question is, why do people sell stocks? Well, people sell stocks for a variety of reasons. And this was a trading full circle. And this is in the free start course under the members area. And this line of reasoning comes from a friend of mine, Dick Fruth. And Dick's been around for a long, long time. And I don't know what he's managing now, but it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And he's a very gregarious type of guy, friendly type of guy. And he's running Fruth Capital Management over there in Houston. And when he got his 
started in the business, he thought that you need to be a broker if you want to be a trader. And so he became a broker. And then he found out that you're really not a trader when you're a broker. And so he would take the orders from people who would actually walk in and give them an order. And instead of just getting their order and snatching the shares out their hands, a lot of times people actually held shares and would actually walk in and hand them over. He would chat them up a little bit, get them a cup of, co cup of coffee, get to know them and say, well, why are you selling the stocks? And a lot of times these reasons such as estate settlement, settlement, divorce, kids, college, buying a house. And I'm doing, I think, three or four of those things right now. I'm not getting divorced, but everything else on that list I think I'm dealing with. And the thing to realize is that none of these reasons have anything to do with the underlying stock. They don't have anything to do with the P.E. of the stock or anything else for that matter. They're just reasons people might sell a stock. As Miriam McClellan once said, which is Tom's McClellan's, uh, Tom McClellan's late mother, and I've often said this over and over, one of the best quotes out there, People buy and sell stocks, paraphrasing, of course, for a variety of reasons. Some people buy when they have money. Some people sell when they need money. And others use for more sophisticated methods. So it all comes down to what is, is. Is the market going up or is the market going down? Now, a couple of things you need to know during a bear market. It could die slowly as hope waxes and wanes. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of bottom pickers come in and a lot of I told you so revision, reversion to the mean type people. And they're getting a little smug because you're getting these sharp bounces back. Well, as I often joke, that'll work until it don't. So there's going to be a lot of hope that's going to happen. And for me right now, and I've been asked this repeatedly, for me to get, and I'm not going to label myself bullish or bearish, but for me to get more constructive towards this market, I'd like to see all-time highs, okay? So that's my definite inflection point. Now, I have a couple of inflection points in between where I might feel a little better or a little worse about this market, and we'll flesh those out in a few minutes. But as a general statement, I would like to see brand new highs before I get too excited. So there's going to be a lot of fits and starts along the way if this is a start of something much bigger. As I've been showing slides lately, sometimes it's more of a process than event. Right now we're dealing with a process type of top, and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now don't confuse the issue with facts. A few minutes ago I said something about the economy, which I don't care about. I don't track. I just look at charts, okay? Okay. But the economy is probably better now than it was when this whole mess started. So don't confuse the issue with facts. Don't look for reasons that suggest this market will come back. What is, is. Now, as we just saw, in general, all stocks eventually become victims. Now, you can have some... Aberrations such as I just said, these small cap, super small cap, micro cap stocks or super speculative issues on a selected basis can trade contra to the overall market or can take off in spite of the overall market and selected IPOs. And sometimes maybe goal related stocks or some other type of commodity related stocks can take off. But as a general statement, that falling tide is going to sink all ships. Retrace rallies suck. I'm going to show you, again, another example where a little discretion was necessary and is necessary. In fact, that's my next point, is that more discretion is required. It's very hard to hold on to a stock on the short side for the long term. More often than not, you will get stopped out. Now, you can reshort. That's a little bit more complicated. You can certainly do that. Sometimes you can use deep in the money options to give you a little bit more holding power. And the bottom line is if you exercise a little bit of discretion, that might be all that's needed 
but to keep you from being a losing trader in a bear market trying to short and a winning trader in a bear market trying to short. And we'll flesh that out in just one second. If you don't walk away with anything, walk away with the fact that you need to pick your spots super carefully, okay? Because eventually everything is going to get hit. My goal right now is to try to catch a few trades along the way in those aforementioned IPOs and maybe in a few of these super speculative issues. And it's tough because one day you come in and the stock's up a tremendous amount and the next day it's down a tremendous amount. So money management is going to be very crucial, especially in a bear market. It's always crucial. Now, the bottom line is, as I often preach, never forget, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. It's okay to get knocked out of position. It's okay to get out of the way of the market. Now, I'm not saying chase your own tail and try to catch every zig and zag, but if we start seeing some major sell signals trigger, which we're getting close to, and I'm going to show you in just one second, then you might want to pull your horns in a little bit. Yeah, so far, this longer-term bull market is still intact. And I'll show you what would change my mind on that. But my mind is being changed very quickly. I'm already trading it as if we're in a bull. I'm sorry, Freudian slip. I'm already trading it as if we are in a bear market because it sure looks like we are. Now, as I said last week, and I'll probably say the next weeks, every week until we go on to make new highs and into a brand new bull market, a little discretion can really, really, really help you out. And I'll probably have the example du jour or example de week <laughs> every week. The secret to trading is catching the occasional outlier. The secret to trend trading is, a catching, is catching the occasional outlier. And the only way you're ever going to make money trading is to what? Capture a trend. Unfortunately, and it's one thing I haven't solved for, is if you don't catch those occasional outliers, your performance is going to be mediocre at best. I've mentioned this, I believe, in my now column. Charlie Kirk has invited me to St. Lucia in December to be his guest of honor, which I'm very honored to accept and be and humbled by that. And he sent me a list of questions that his members were asking him that want answers to in retreat and one of them was on statistics and expectations and things like that unfortunately unlike the scumbags on the internet who are probably going to advertise on this channel here i shouldn't say that because i'm making money off of them <laughs> but just be leery anyone who makes it look like it's easy that you could pull money out of the market every day is is full of it and not only digress too far but i know too late but I recently proofed Linda Rasky's book. And what I love the most about it, or one of the things I love the most, was how realistic she was and how hard she admitted trading was. And she's one of the greatest traders out there. So it is tough. And it's not as easy as people make it. And you cannot put some sort of statistic to it. As I often say, if you could, you could own the world even with the tiniest of edges. Again, as I often say, the casino industry has a very, very small edge when you're looking at certain high-stake games where people spend a lot of money and risk a lot of money. I'm not talking about a slot machine, obviously, but in high-stake games, their, their edge might only be a half a percent. But they know statistically it's going to adhere to that half a percent. If you do, you could make a certain amount of money trading any methodology, okay? Even if it's a very small amount, even a very small edge, as long as that edge held statistically, you would eventually own the world because you could put everything you own into it and you're guaranteed that income. Unfortunately, as they often preach, if you want to guarantee, buy a toaster. Now, getting back to discretion, the way you catch that occasional outlier, or I should say 
help to ensure that you catch that occasional outlier, especially on the short side when it's really tough, is that you have to be willing to apply a little tiny bit of discretion. Not a lot. I'm not saying throw caution to the wind. But as I said last week, if you come in, and this is an actual stock, and the close is right here and your stop is right here and you're pretty darn close to that stop, you know on this day here the chances of that stop getting hit are pretty good. There's almost 100% chance that it's going to hit that stop. But especially if this market is overbought in here and you're short like this, and this is a retrace rallies, retrace rallies what? Suck, okay? <laughs> You know there's a good chance it's going to get hit. So what you could do is pull the stop. And by the way, I use, when I place a hard stop, I use a day order. So at the end of the day, the stop evaporates, okay? And then I put the stop back in the next day after the stock finds its opening range. Now, by finding its opening range, if it goes, if it does this, it keeps doing that, then you have to have, as I often preach, an uncle point in mind. But if you're willing to give stocks a little bit of wiggle room, especially around the open, many times you can survive what I call a stop nick, okay? And if you go in and watch the week of charts from last week, today's November 7th, so I guess it was November 8th, I talked about the GDDY example, and I think it was about $17 or $18 extra risk on a hundred thousand dollar account by giving it a little bit of that little bit of wiggle room. Now this week we have yet another example where this is Intap where we got in there and initially it kind of moved in our favor and we felt pretty good. And I think the stop was trailed down a little bit and the stop ended up here. Well then you had a sharp retrace rally. Well the stock still looks like it's in a lot of trouble longer term. But you have to be willing to honor your stop just in case. But in this particular case, it just came up, barely kind of nicked that stop. In fact, the thickness of my line, you can't even see where the stop actually was. I think it went to 83, if memory serves, 95 was the peak. And our stop was at 75, okay? So it was only, what's that, a 20%, a 20, 20%, 20 cent difference, okay? And by willing, I'm not saying throw caution to win. The stock's way up here. Shoot me an email and say, Dave, what do I do? It's like, well, you should have gotten out, obviously, somewhere around that stop when it got blown through. But if it just comes up and kind of nicks that stop, even though it sucks while it's going against you, you say, okay, well, let's just, let's just see if it finds its high. And if it does, we'll put that stop back in. And you can see in this particular case, what happens a lot of times on the short side, sharp retrace, and then they do what? They die. Linda Rasky once said, and I asked her where if it was her quote directly. She says, I don't remember saying that, but if I if it's probably a florism, something I picked up when I used to trade on the floor. A market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So if a market's gonna sell off hard. What's going what's gonna to happen first? It's going to have a sharp retrace rally. And a corollary to that that she gave in that same speech was that the market will do what it has to do to frustrate the most traders. So if it's obviously rolling over, it's going to have a sharp retrace rally, of course, before it does. And that's going to do what? Frustrate the most traders. So if you think about these things from a psychological perspective, it makes a lot of sense. So here's the actual, this is the mechanical, this is what happened mechanically, okay? And this is what happened with a little bit of discretion. So that's like a $2,600 round number improvement from a loss up into a gain. And if you look at that as on a 100K account, just to keep the math easy, because this is what this is based on, that's a 2.6% improvement on the portfolio. Another way of looking at it is a 1% gain versus a minus 1.6% loss on the overall portfolio. And just a little tiny bit of discretion, again, can make all the difference in the world. Now, again, I'm not doing this to pour salt in the wounds, 
Because I can guarantee you, what did I say last week? I can guarantee you next week or next month, there's going to be another one where a little bit of discretion would have kept you in. And I don't want to make it look like the fish that got away or this always happens because sometimes it doesn't. But if you understand how to use discretion when you're picking your own stocks or if Big Dave gets hit by a beer truck, at least you'll understand how it works and how that market is not going to adhere to exacts. What did I just spend a lot of time talking about? How the market does not adhere perfectly to statistics, okay? The market does also does it also adhere perfectly to exacts. And that's why a little discretion goes a long, long ways. Where do you give up when it nicks your stop? It depends, okay? On an 80-something dollar stock, you might give it an extra point, okay? Because that's like a what is that? Like a quarter, uh, maybe a half a percent, or not even a, or maybe one percent. It depends. You have to decide. See if that opening range gets set. Let's let's get a blank screen. So let's say let's use the long side since people understand that a little bit more. And let's say the stock starts to retrace. Let's say it closes down here, and your stop is here. Okay. Well, if the stock, let's say it opens here, it goes through that, okay? You have to have some sort of uncle point in mind. So the question that Mike is asking is, where is that uncle point? Well, it depends, okay? On an 80-something dollar stock, and if it's, I uh, forget what it was, I think it was 83.75, then an extra quarter of a point is not that much, Okay. Let it open, see what happens, let it find its range, and then put your stop back in, okay? So I don't have an exact for you, but just use a little common sense, okay? I tend to err on the side of being a little too liberal, and I will let that stock get a little further away from me. But once it starts getting away from me, I'm like, okay, Dave, you really need to practice what you preach and it's either blown through that uncle point or I'm going to set an uncle point fairly close to where it is, especially if I see it bounce a little bit intraday and say, all right, well, now I'm going to get out. No questions asked. And then I'll actually put in a hard stop. OK, before I started this presentation, I put in some hard stops on some positions that are going against me that I was trying to work a little discretion with to stick with. OK. So just use a little common sense. 20 cents on an $83.75 stock is not that much. Many times, as I often point out, it'll be to within a few cents sometimes. Okay. But you can't you can't be down here somewhere and a stock just keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping. And then you finally decide to throw in the towel. What I'm saying is just give it a little room around that stop. I'm trying to figure out a way longer term to where I can create a group of traders who can not try to make everything work mechanically, but be able to use a little discretion, use their minds and, and not their emotions, okay, to become better and better traders. And, and my ultimate goal, I think, with this would be to have us as a, I hate to use the word tribe because that's what Sakota used, but for lack of a better word, this trading tribe to where we could be a bit of a collective and maybe a collegial type of relationship, okay? So, yeah, just use some common sense, Mike. Don't throw caution to the wind. I cannot give you an exact number, but an extra 1% move on an 80-something dollar stock is not that big of a deal, okay? And if you overall you lose, let's say you're risking 2%, overall you lose 2% and a little bit of change on the position because you were trying to stick with the position, that's okay because longer term you're going to catch enough of these. And that's the secret. Once again, catch enough of these outliers. Longer term you're going to catch enough of these outliers or even just one good trade will pay for about 10 trades where you apply a little discretion. Okay, I always get this question, the very common question. Will one ATR be a good drop dead for a drop dead for a stock? 
Um, the problem with statistical measurements, as I alluded to earlier, is that markets don't adhere to statistics. Now, with that said, if you look at where I place my stops based on eyeballing the charts, based on looking at what the HV is, I don't make a calculation off that historical volatility, but I'm looking at where the HV is, and I'm saying, okay, self, this stock is at HV of 150. If I go and trade this, it's going to be wild and crazy. I better give it a really wide berth, okay? So you can use these statistical measurements to give you an idea but then eyeball the chart, and then as I often say, go in and look at the money management and met on the members area and ask yourself, where would you be wrong on a trade, okay? So without re-giving that whole speech or speech is for all those lessons of the money management, if you're trading a base first pullback after base breakout, it goes back to the base, you're wrong. If you're trading a bow tie off of lows and you're looking to go long and you do go long, and it goes down and makes brand new lows, then you're wrong. If you're shorting the stock market right now, bigger picture wise from a bow tie, and it goes on to make new highs, then you're, you're obviously wrong. Now, you wouldn't want to give up that much. That's kind of an extreme example, but you kind of get the idea. Let's say you shorted that first bow tie in the Russell, then your drop dead point that you're talking about would be if the market went on to make new highs. So, Use your ATRs if you want, experiment with it to give you a good idea where a stop should be, but then also eyeball a chart and figure out where you would be wrong. The reason my stop was up in the mid 80s on this one was because I figured that if it started pushing through this overhead supply up here, then I was wrong on the trade, okay? You're welcome, Johnny. Good to see you. Is that your real last name? Now, as I often say, all major, you hope so. <laughs> all major tops and bottoms will have a transitional pattern. And that could be a bow tie, a first thrust, or something along those lines. Now, what were we just talking about earlier? Where's your drop dead point? Okay, here's the Russell 2000. <laughs> He's been using it for 73 years. Here's your Russell 2000 all time highs when back here, end of August, as I just discussed. Your bow tie trigger is when right here. Okay, not that you would give it wiggle room all the way to the top, but you know that if it comes all the way to the top up here about 174, you are absolutely wrong on that trade. Okay. Now, if you do your ATRs and all, it might come out to 174, okay? Do your ATRs. Do look at your historical volatility, okay? And after you do all that, just say, well, wait a minute. There's a lot of overhead supply in here, okay? And what has Dave been talking about quite often? That a bow tie remains in place. Not that you want to hold a short position, but a bow tie top remains in place until and unless the market goes on to make new highs. Or, obviously, if it goes down and bottoms out three or four years from now and makes a bottom and the bow tie up, then it's like, okay, well, it looks like that's the bottom now. But coming off of high levels like this, your transitional pattern remains in place until proven wrong. So, so far, that daily bow tie has proven to be the top for this market. Another case in point, here's the S&P 500 on a daily chart. This chart's about a week or two old, and we'll look at some fresh charts in just a minute. But here's all-time highs. Here's your bow tie, your first thrust also, your pullback, and then depends on where you want to get in, but somewhere in this pullback here from this first thrust or bow tie, you can see that would be your short. This top on a daily chart remains in place until unless what? The market goes up to 29 50 or so, okay? Now, if we look at a weekly chart, now this is a fresh chart here, and this is the same bow tie indicator, which is available in Metastock for free. And you can see that this ribbon down here stays bullish as long as what? As long as 
the 10 simple is above the 20 exponential and is above the 30 exponential. The 20 is above the 30. So the 10 is greater than a 20 is greater than 30. That's going to be bullish. If one of these is in between, it's going to be neutral. And if all three flip over, it's going to be bearish. So if you're looking at this for longer term market timing, so far it's what? It's still bullish. But notice that the 10 week moving average is coming down hard. That's a simple. The 20 week moving average, that's an exponential, is coming down hard. And the 30 week exponential moving average is coming down hard. So we could see a crossing in those fairly soon. As I've been preaching ad nauseum, not every signal will turn into the mother of all trends, but every trend will start with a signal. And you, you occasionally will get whipsawed, but as Greg Morris says, I'm going to repeat the debt, beat the dead horse and say two things that he says all the time. You treat all signals as if they will become the big one. And whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. You could survive what? Frustration. But not devastation. Okay, if you know me, I like to keep things simple. And through my teaching, a lot of times I'll, I'm like, okay, well, how can I illustrate this point in the simplest fashion? And that's my, my buy at B pattern for IPOs is just basically with, with quite a few caveats, but basically you're looking to buy an IPO on a new closing high, and that's it. And I wanted to come up with a simple little system or method or setup, whatever you want to call it, that would keep you out of hyped, highly hyped IPOs such as Snapchat. And I said, well, what if I just put a five-day moving average in? That way, number one, you couldn't trade that stock for at least a week. And number two, it had to be a new closing high. And number three, the low had to be greater than the moving average. So that way you have a little momentum. You're closing at a new closing high. And then I think the other rule was that it had to also close above the first day's trading range. And I've discussed this in a lot more details under IPOs in the members area. And that's going to actually become part of the IPO course too. So that was how I came up with that little system. In more recent times, if you study technical analysis, the reason technical analysis works because is because it's a hard, fast, concrete rule. If a market is going to go through A to from A to C, it's going to have to pass through B along the way. No other methodology, and I'm going to say the F word again, such as one that uses fundamentals, has a hard and fast concrete rule. You cannot say if the PE of the stock is a certain number, you're going to buy it because that simply doesn't work. And by the way, it always amazes me. People say, Dave, you use PE? It's like, yeah, I just use the numerator. Okay. <laughs> it always amazes me. And Greg Morris actually pointed this out. I borrow a lot of stuff from him. But the most widely used fundamental indicator probably in the world has price as a component. Okay. So use the PE if you want to, but just get rid of the denominator. Just use the numerator. Okay. In other words, just use price. We'll get to that, Howard. Howard wants to know about the Russell. We're going to take a live look at the market in just one second. So along the lines of the ABCs of technical analysis, I began to say, what would happen if you sold every time a market was 10% off of its high? And just to put a little whipsaw filter there, and also closed below its 50-week moving average. And I found that, and obviously there's no guarantees in this business, but I found that that silly little simple system would have kept you out of most, and most being the key word, but most bear markets in history, or I should say the majority of every bear market in history, would have kept you out of every bear market in history, even in 1987. Now, I know it's a little dangerous to say these things because it could have obviously went the other way. But in 1987, the market crashed on a Monday 
and there was a sell signal Friday afternoon, okay, in this. And so you would have avoided that one big day crash. So, again, all we're looking for with this is as long as the market's within 10% of its high, we're going to stay long, okay? Now, before I go any further, for those new to these presentations, keep in mind I'm not suggesting that you do this on a mechanical basis. I just want to show you something really simple to help you time the markets and let you know where you are in the general scheme of things. And if you're buy and hold type of, and I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, I hate to say the word financial planner, but if you buy and hold guy tries to keep you in the market, provided you go out and do a little studying on this, go back and look at the last 150 years like I did and see for yourself, provided you believe in this, then you could say, well, you know, if it's going to go from A down to C, it's going to pass through B along the way. It looks like we're passing through B. We might as well get out of the market. And maybe you can educate him on that. I know someone who used to run a very large fund, and they actually used mutual funds initially. And the mutual fund managers would hate it at a time like this when he would go in and start selling those funds. And he would tell them, he's like, you know, I'm actually doing you a favor right now. You're welcome. <laughs> letting you know that the market's in trouble and getting out of the way. But they didn't see it like that because I guess the funds tend to have a buy and hold mantra to them. Anyway, so again, as long as we're somewhere between B and C, we're going to stay long. So where's B, where's C? Well, C is any time we're below or within, I should say, 10% of the – closing high and in this case I think I use a 50 week closing high we're going to stay long and anytime we're greater than that away meaning that we're past this 10% line we're going to exit the market and possibly even look to short with the caveat that we're also below the 50-day moving average. Now, that's a whipsaw filter on the downside that you must close, just simply close below the 50-week moving average. And on the upside, you have to have two bars of Dave light, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average for at least two bars. Now, that's a very, very, very simple whipsaw filter, and I stop there. And I would recommend when you're looking at something, Look for a whipsaw filter, but don't try to filter out every single whipsaw. Or otherwise, you're going to end up curve fitting your system and you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. So find something simple for a whipsaw filter and just know that, like death and taxes, you're not going to avoid all whipsaws. But if you come up with a good little system, you might avoid all bear markets. So where are we with this, okay? Well, we came very close to a sell signal when back in April, when the market was struggling a little bit, almost got there, okay? And then now we got fairly close recently. You can see right here, we closed what? Below the 50-week moving average. But we weren't quite to 10%. So if you're following the system long, long, longer term, it's still actually bullish or it's still actually long. Now, if you look at this ribbon down here, this ribbon says a couple things. It says, one, I want the lows to be greater than the moving average. And two, I want to make sure we're less than 10% away from highs. So notice it stayed bullish for a long, long, long time. And here, from when? From July all the way to 2018, February 2018. It went neutral in April. It went bullish again. It went neutral for a little while recently. Why? Well, because the price was below 
or intersecting, I should say, the 50-week moving average. It did both, actually. And then now we're neutral again because we're what? We're below the 50-week moving average. So simple, simple, simple system. Take the market timing course. I go through it in a lot of details and spell out, spell out, spell out all the exact rules there. And that's free again. So now we're neutral according to the system, but not too far away from a trigger to exit the market or possibly even short for the aggressive. Now, as I've been saying on and off for years, you cannot have a market without downside Dave light. And this is just simply, is the price bar greater than the moving average? Is the low of the price bar, I should say, greater than the moving average or is it less than the moving average? And this meta stock, this uh, indicator, by the way, is free in MetaStock 16. And get the link from me if you're looking to uh, to get that. I do, I'd say, nearly all of my analysis in Telechart, and I'm affiliate for them too. And I do a lot of my research, or nearly all of my research in MetaStock, and that's where this indicator comes from. And I had them program this magnitude indicator. It just counts the days of Dave Light, and it resets if the market trades back to the moving average. So in this particular case here, during a bear market of 2000 to 2003, we had that one little kiss of the moving average, which was right here, and we didn't have any green whatsoever. And the point is, using this really simple indicator – which is going to stay mostly green doing bull markets and what? Mostly red doing bear markets can keep you out of a lot of trouble. Now, one thing I'm going to caution you against, notice that the green goes on for a long, long time, and the red doesn't last very long as a general statement, unless you go back to maybe the 70s. I wasn't trading then. I'm old, but I'm not that old, huh? <laughs> I'm getting there, though. Anyway... It will stay mostly green in bull markets and mostly red in bear markets. And my point is, you can't have a bear market without downside Dave Light. We did have this little spill in around 2011, early 2012. And then the last time the market looked questionable was back in 2015, 2016. And then so far, believe it or not, we don't have any downside Dave Light. And that's using a weekly 50-week or I should say a 50-week simple moving average and price, okay? So red would be, and I know you guys who are, who've been around know all this already, but for this to be red, in this case here, that's moving average price, the high of the price, you have to have Dave Light is less than the moving average. For this to be green, the low of the price has to be greater than moving average. What's going to amaze you is when you play with your charts is how – Dave Light can help to keep you on the right side of the market, any market. You're welcome. I just pay for your webinar. Now, when we zoom in, this is what it looks like. And you can see we have one little kiss of the moving average. And then we recently had a little kiss of the moving average. And that's why this indicator here, which just counts the number of days that we're above the moving average, reset itself down to zero, okay? And then this is the 2015-16 sell-off, which was pretty ugly. The Rusty lost, what? About 18% after we had a weekly bow tie there, I believe. And this is ugly enough here, even if you got whipsawed, nothing wrong with getting out the way. In fact, if you're a trader and you didn't short during this period of time, then shame on you, okay? Not that you should short, because shorts are a pain in the ass, as I often say. But this was a pretty ugly period of time. And this actually, this rewarded what? The buy and hold people. Okay? Just hold on. Just hold on. Just hold on. So everybody here for what? Almost two years or at least a year and a half goes to visit their little uh, financial planner, whatever you want to call him. Salesman. <laughs> and he says, just stay long. It always comes back. And then... Somewhere around here, like, you see, aren't you glad you listened to me? Well, that'll work until it don't. And it's amazing. 
how all these guys drink their own Kool-Aid. Now, bear markets, when a market tops, it seems like a big event because the media announces it. Oh, stocks are falling off and oh, another horrible day on Wall Street. You know, it's just abysmal. And it makes it sound like a, a switch just gets flipped overnight. Well, I had been drawing this in by hand, but I found out that just a 2% zigzag, I do not use a zigzag, but a 2% zigzag will give you pretty much the same exact lines that I've been drawing. And I'm not saying use this indicator. All I'm saying is it helps to illustrate, as indicators do, that the top is more of a process than an event. Okay? So this market has been topping out for how long? Almost one year. So this is one year in the making. Now, if we keep selling off hard and take out the recent lows in here around 2,600, then it's going to feel like, oh, it was just this one big event that happened in October. Well, the reality is, as a general statement, and I learned this also from the AAPTA, bear markets or markets, bear markets begin as a process and bull markets and bear markets end as more of an event. So you're... Sell-offs usually, not all the time, but usually they're more of a process. And I have a friend of mine. He's a little older than me, been around a lot longer than me. And we were talking markets, as we often do when we see each other. And he was just saying, Dave, whenever you see the volatility start getting crazy, that's usually the sign of a top. And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to say. And you could see that everything was pretty orderly coming into this. And then the volatility starts getting crazy. doesn't mean that you should sell right away, but look at this. Sharp sell-off, retrace, sell-off, retrace, sell-off, retrace. You know, you can see that it's starting to get kind of crazy in here. And if you didn't know anything about markets, what's the net, net price change? Okay, where's the market now? Where was the market a month ago, two months ago, three months ago, four months ago? Well, your big blue arrow has gone from what? It's gone from that to this. Okay. Now, maybe it'll go up, maybe it won't, but at the least, you have to acknowledge that this market has lost momentum. Should we have sold in February more than 10% away under 50 SMA? Um, I don't know if we were. Were we? So he said in February. I wonder if we have a, a new chart on that. I don't think we were. I think it was close. No, you didn't have a sell signal in February. Because it never closed below the 50-week moving average. And it came dangerously close to the 10% threshold. So, yeah, Howard, that was a near miss in February, but it was close. Now, when you get that close, and again, we're not trading this mechanically. When you get that close, maybe... I wouldn't fault you for selling then. You sure certainly avoided a lot of grief, okay? You, yeah, you might have missed a tiny bit of upside, and you may have questioned your market timing. But it was pretty ugly back then. But no, according to the system, if you're looking at the exact system, it was not an official sell signal then. And the point I'm making now is it's not an official sell signal just yet. Notice we had a couple of kisses of the weekly moving average. And now we're back below the weekly moving average once again. So we could see some downside Dave line in the weekly. I would be concerned if that happens. We could see some the bow ties coming together on the weekly. I would be concerned if that happens. Is there a death cross in the works? And the answer is yes. Even if the market stabilizes it here, keep in mind, as I often talk about, you're going to be dropping off higher prices and adding in relatively lower prices down here. So even if the market flatlines for a little while, this 50-day moving average is continuing to drop. What I find really fascinating is that look at this 200-day moving average. It actually has a negative slope to it. That's another one of those things. If you didn't know anything about the markets and said, well, you know what? As long as the 200-day moving average has a positive slope, I'm going to stay long. 
And as long as the 200-day moving average is headed lower or has a negative slope, I'm going to stay short or I'm just going to stay out of the markets. Well, that simple little silly thing would probably work out pretty good longer term. It doesn't have to be rocket science. Okay. Now, this slide is left over from weeks prior. I'm seeing a lot of picking bottoms at the top. So this is the market, and let's say it's doing this and looking pretty ugly. A lot of people are trying to say that's the low. Well, it might be, but that's a pretty dangerous thing to do. I would rather pick a bottom at a bottom. So let's say the market bottoms out for several years in here and it starts to rally. It's like, okay, well, I'm not picking a bottom, but it looks like the trend has turned. Right now, I'm thinking it looks like the trend has turned down, and I'm going to stick with that until proven otherwise. And again, and I'm not couching here. I'm just showing you longer term, it's still in a bit of a bull phase or at worst, a neutral phase. It hasn't turned bearish longer term. Now, that doesn't mean as a trend follower that I haven't gotten out the way. I haven't gotten stopped out of my longs. So as usual, it ain't over till it's over. Don't try to anticipate. Just follow along. Remain super duper cautious and then stay setup driven. If you like a setup, long or short, and you really, really like it, and especially the long side, just make sure you think it could trade contra to the overall market. And what would that be at this juncture? Go back to the sinking ship. That would be probably a very speculative stock, such as an IPO or a very speculative small cap stock. Other than that, you probably don't want to be buying anything right now. Okay, let's go ahead and open it up for individual questions. And I've covered this slide quite a bit, so I just left it in here in case we needed it. But basically, discretion is using your brain to generally improve your performance, and it's minor tweaks while not drifting too far from the methodology. Do not say that you're applying discretion, pull your stop, and email me six months from now when you're down 50, 60, 70, 80% and ask me what to do because that is not discretion. Discretion is giving it a little wiggle room to try to stay with the position. Micromanagement, much more dangerous thing. Micromanagement is abandoning the original plan in an attempt to outsmart the market. And as I often say, market would be a bad teacher. It often pays over the short term, but never longer term. So big difference between those. Now, I would urge you, I know I have a vested interest in this, but I would urge you to take the market timing course and you'll be up to speed and you'll know as much as I do about all these systems we're talking about in here. And if it's not in the banner ad, again, go to members and click on that. If you're already a gold member or a free member, you have access to both of these. If you're a gold member, just take the market timing within the members course. If you're a free member, just take the market timing, obviously, within the free section of the website. So again, check out the learning management system if you have a chance. I'm My new modus operandi is I want to help everyone who's willing to help themselves. If you really want to learn, I'm here. Obviously, there's going to be a cost for that. I'm not that altruistic. But if you are struggling, if you're having psychological problems, I guess psychological problems is a bad way of putting it. If you're having emotional or trading psychology type of problems, then we can look at your progress. And if you haven't completed something like mindset, maybe that's the issue. If you're having money management problems, setting stops, and you haven't completed money management, maybe that's the problem. So we have a tracking system now in place to see where you are so I don't have to guess. And I can see whether you're doing your work or not, too. All right, let's hop into the charts. Boy, Chief Warman really wound up today. All right, let's start talking about individual stocks. If you guys have some in mind, I just want to pull up a few things. We kind of beat the dead horse already on the overall market. You can see we had this witch hat type of retrace, and notice that we stalled perfectly. This is almost textbook in nature, right at this prior peak in here. So what this gives us is a little structure to work with. If we get above 2,800 and change, let's say 2,825, round numbers, or if we drop below, 
what's this number here? Let's just say 2,600 round numbers. So write those down. Then the market's in trouble. If it drops below 2,600, it's in trouble. Lots of trouble. If it gets above 2,800, it might be okay, 2,825. So you want to look at a weekly bow tie, you said, in the S&P 500 or the Russell. They're both looking kind of ugly. Let's zoom in a little bit on that Rusty, or I'm sorry, the S&P. S&P has a ways before it's going to cross, but you can see, as we just showed a few minutes ago, it is coming together. Let's take a look at the Rusty. The Rusty is a little bit closer to crossing, as you can see, and let's take a look at how close it is. Now, obviously, it's a moving target because we don't have today's data yet. But we can see that the 10-day moving average is where? 159.19. That's below the 20. And the 20 is not quite below the 30. So technically, for those keeping home score at home, it's not a bow tie on the weekly just yet. Pay attention when it does happen. But you can see it's already a first thrust down. We had this thrust down here. And then we had a little retrace back up. So that's a signal there, which will be followed by a likely be followed by a bow tie down. And what happened last time, again, we lost 18% from that level. Okay, keep the questions coming. Just want to go through a couple of more things, and we'll look at those individual stocks. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ real quick since we haven't talked about that yet. So the NASDAQ, on a weekly basis, look what's happening here. Your bow ties are coming down fast. We could have a crossing fairly soon. On a daily basis, we had a first thrust. We also had a bow tie down. And so far, we sold off fairly hard out of that retrace rally. Like the S&P and other indices, you do have some inflection points. If we take out the October lows, could get ugly. If we take out the October highs, that could be a good thing, right? Or at least 77.50, somewhere around this retrace rally. When you go through, like I was kind of beating on those um, buy and hope people. But the point is, if you look at these major sectors in here, down, 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 retrace, down, down. Their argument was that we're in sector rotation. Well, where is the sector rotation? I'm not seeing too many sectors you could rotate into that are going higher. And that's probably part of the reason that, plus I also saw it in my IPO videos, but that's encourages me to do encourage me to do the rats leaving the ship while the ship is sinking. And that sinking ship will sink all stocks. All right. Susie so wants to know about NIO. That's one I've been watching. Um, it has kind of bottomed out in here. It's starting to look a little interesting. But I would like to, we were talking about this with the Facebook group. By the way, if you are a gold member, go to the Facebook group and request to join, and I'll let you in. But you can see that so far it's in a range. And let's take a look at the bow ties. I do like a bow tie in moving in uh, IPOs when they come public, sell off hard and bottom out like this NIO has done. But in this particular case, I would like to see a couple things happen or one or two things happen. One, I'd like to see a pretty serious rally, maybe above eight. And then two, a little bit of a pullback. So I would keep an eye out on this one for a, for a bow tie, maybe, or a first thrust. I think it's too early to anticipate a breakout here just yet. Okay. Any other stocks? Oh, you're welcome. Happy to do it. Okay. Any others? Just one? Well, there's not a lot to look at. So my Landry list today is like really, really small. Let's take a look at Amazon real quick because that's kind of the – we had Amazon on the list not that long ago. 
And it's really not getting hit that hard this morning. The media is making a big deal about it. But you can see you had a bow tie in here, of course, a sharp retrace, pain in the butt, right? And then it's making a new leg lower. CWK. Uh, natural gas, you have any symbols you want me to look at on that? Uh, this one looks okay. You look at the range, though, Phil. And what do they do? You pretty, you normally know what company. What, what do they do? Let's figure out what they, what they do. But it's a fairly small range for an IPO, 15 and 19. I guess that's okay. In a case like this, I would let it break out to new highs and then look to play a first pullback. I wouldn't be as excited to play like a buy at B or something like that. I would prefer if it, if it proved itself and take more of like a trend resumption type of pattern. So see if it can rally and then maybe play a pullback. Real estate manager. Yeah. You know, some of these, I guess that's one area that's not horrible right now in spite of interest rates is real estate. We take a look at the 30-year bond. From a, from a good news department, we could see that it did sort of find some lows in here recently. Let's take a look at the weekly. You can see it's still got a long ways. It still has a long ways to go on the weekly, but at least it's kind of finding its lows for now. Is there a natural gas? What's it? UNG maybe? Well, it's taken off in here. I don't know if this, I know there's a problem with some of these, these natural gas ETFs. Um, no, I'm not trading natural gas at this juncture, but maybe some natural gas stocks come along. But yeah, good eye on that. Uh, it's taken off, pull back a little bit. And it could be worth, it could be worth a trade. Sure. Gloria, welcome back. Good to see you. Where have you been? <laughs> Apple toast, shorter retrace. Ah, Apple toast. Apple's one of those darling stocks. It's always been hard to make money in Apple. It just kind of goes up forever. <laughs> but eventually it won't. Uh, short, I think, yes. I think shorting this one on retrace rallies would be would work. Okay. There might be something else that's a little bit more cleaner and also a big cap that's worthwhile. But yeah, I think stick a fork in that one for now. NEM is going to be a commodity related stock. I think that's Newmont. Well, so far, I'm not seeing anything to get excited about here, but if we back the chart out, eh, it's kind of bottoming out at multi-year lows. You know me, I like to see major, major lows like we saw back here in 2016 when we did go after some gold stocks. I think, Phil, you probably remember going after some back then. Uh, if it gets out of this range, maybe, but let's just give it some, uh, just sit back and relax for now on that one. LQDA bought, buy it, B, made a lot of money, then stopped out. Where would you get back in? LQDA. QDA, it is a blast from the past. <laughs> well, in a case like this, I'm not going to play this huge retracement here, okay? So I would like to see it rally back up into the 30s at least or go down and bottom out for a long time and make a bow tie or something. So this one's not going to set up for a long, long time. So there's no place to really get back in. Well, congratulations. Good for you. I lost a lot of clients, that one little pattern. <laughs> I tried to tell everybody, look, this – this IPO bull market is not going to last forever. But that's okay. I was a victim of my own success. That's kind of, that makes me feel kind of good. Yeah, IBM is a short. Um, I like to find stocks. This is kind of late in the game type of trade. I prefer finding stocks like, like INTU. GDDY, okay, stocks that are still way up here as opposed to stocks that are longer-term downtrend. Now, if we get into a longer-term bear market, God forbid, I don't want a bear market, okay? I just call them as I see them, what is is, right? But if we get into a long-term bear market, 
then we will be forced to trade those trend resumption type of patterns. But right now, stocks are still at pretty high levels. So I would be looking for shorts at fairly high levels. As, as a general statement, you want to match the pattern to the overall market. LOGC. And you say it's thin. Yes, it's very thin. So, yeah, be super careful on that one. But what was I saying earlier? Super speculative issues such as IPO, biotech IPOs. Yeah, I would be really careful with this one. I think I might at this juncture. I think I would wait to see if it could rally and play a pullback as opposed to try to play like a buy at B, which have gotten you long. On one of the days in here. No, probably not till 15. Yeah. Even though 15 would be sort of a re-trigger, I think I would wait to see if they could follow through. The video is a weekly bow tie. Let's take a look at that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, good eye on that one. Who's that? Howard? Good eye, Howard. Yeah, so here's a stock that's well, it has a crack, it has it crack, it hasn't quite crossed over yet, but I hear you, okay. But yeah, any market that makes a weekly bow tie down after all time highs, especially something like Nvidia, where the whole world went crazy over it, okay. I guess it's a Bitcoin mining or whatever. That looks like the mother of all tops to me. So good eye on that one, Howard. High five. Maybe in my next life, I'm just going to trade weekly bow ties on something like that. The only problem is you're going to miss you're going to miss that first push higher. I don't know if I can walk away from my screens that much. Short mu. Uh well, again, what are we what are we doing? We're trading stocks at higher levels. This is it's fairly low levels now. I hear you though; it still has ways to go. It's not currently set up, at least from what I can tell. And it's kind of it's 4250. It was at 4250 back in September. So I think I'd pass on that one. But yeah, you're short, stay short. I hear you. MCD short term then at the top. McDonald's. NVIDIA options pricing a 9% move. Over what period of time? What are you looking at? Implied to historical? Uh, McDonald's is up here towards new highs. So, no, that's not a short yet. Maybe yet be the key word in that sentence. But as I talk about with Go Go No Mo, that's Go Go No Mo, No More Momentum Strategy. Okay. Oh, so earnings tonight. Um, recently I've been asked a lot and we've been covering this in the Q and a session. What do you do about earnings? Nothing, but what can you do? Nothing. But if you go to short a stock and especially if they're coming into earnings, which you might consider doing. So the video is what $200 round numbers. So how much, what's that times a hundred? Is that uh $20,000? So you're going to have to put up $20,000 for every 100 shares you short. As opposed to doing that, I've got to be careful not to open up a can of worms. But you might look at deep in the money options where the extrinsic has come off and then look to play those options, whereas you might be putting up $1,000 per 100 shares versus $20,000 per 100 shares, okay? And if you don't know how to do that, see my first book. There's a chapter in there, very simple chapter. If you know options, you'll probably roll your eyes at it. If you don't know options, you might scratch your head a little bit. But just know that the deeper the money you go, the more extrinsic or fluff, as I like to call it, will come off, and the more intrinsic value will be in there. Okay. Howard says SMH, and we've got time for maybe one more. At CMH Weekly Bow Tie. Hey, Rick. Good to see you. Yeah, look at that. Good eye, Howard. Um, 
And that's what you're going to see going through these indices, going through. Here's the thing. Nearly all sectors right now look a lot like the indices themselves. You've got what's happening in indices. We could see weekly bow ties soon. What's happening in almost all sectors. We could see weekly bow ties soon if we have it already, if they already have it bow tied. Okay. So, yeah, that could be the mother of all tops and semiconductors. Yeah, look at that. And it's coming off of all-time highs. So, yeah, that could be a, a longer-term short. Absolutely, okay? You're shortening the 90s. You put a stop in above the high. You go on vacation. And you're either going to get proven right big or wrong, fairly small. AMD for Mr. Rick. Let's see what that is on a weekly basis. Weekly basis. Okay. Definitely a stock that looks like it's in trouble. You do have quite a bit of support down here. Okay. And it's already broken down. It's already lost half its value. So I hear you. I think it's in trouble. But what were we just looking at? We were just looking at the weekly SMH. If the overall semis are at this high a level and in the early phases of breaking down, I would imagine you could probably find some semiconductors at high levels or while you're waiting for that to happen, while you're looking for those, maybe short the SMH in and of itself, okay, Rick? And see if you can find something at a little bit higher levels that hasn't broken down. But, yeah, it's definitely a downtrend. I can't argue with you on that. It's not exactly set up now. And I would go through all your semiconductors. We can't do it right now. There's not enough time because of the recording the Recording works. But I would go through all your semiconductors and see if you can find something at a little bit higher levels. All right. Well, look, I'm out of time. Out of time. I appreciate everybody taking time out of the busy schedules to be here. I am humbled by your presence. As you know, I love doing these shows. No show next week. It's Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving if you're here in the States. If you're somewhere else, happy Thursday. Everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then. Hopefully I'll see all you guys and girls again next week. Thank you so much.